Matthew 5, 6 says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they, and they alone, shall be filled. You may be seated. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If Jesus only said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, we would conclude that everyone on the face of the earth is blessed by God. If all he said, blessed are those who hunger, then that means every individual is truly blessed by God, is considered to be blessed by God because everyone hungers, everyone thirsts, everybody wants food, everybody wants drink. And not only do we want these things, but we need these things to survive. But then again, there are many who hunger for power and pleasure and position and praise and perversions and possessions. So we live in a world of hungry people. We live in a world filled with thirsty people. And those on the Broadway, that is the majority of the world, are hungry and thirsty for all the wrong things and will never be truly filled and will never be truly satisfied. The hole in their soul remains. Everyone was designed and created with a hole in the soul. And if it is not God and His ways that fills it, we feel empty because we are empty. And until God takes residence in that heart of ours and fills it every square inch, it is then and only then that we will truly experience what it means to be happy on this side of eternity. God is the only one that can make us happy. And the reason why is because God Himself is the source of all happiness. There is absolute and complete joy in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because He is the source of joy. So if you try to find any type of happiness or satisfaction in the things that this world has to offer, you'll never experience true joy. Some of you might be saying, wow, it's that simple? It is. It is. And I believe if more and more people just believe this reality, there would be a lot less people on depression pills. And I don't down on them because I understand that there are physical issues that people have. But I want you to know that the majority of those popping pills would be healed if they would just look to God and be filled by Him. He's far better than those pills, I'll tell you that much. Jesus was very specific here. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is it that we are to hunger and thirst for? It is righteousness. What does that mean exactly? Hunger for righteousness. What righteousness? Whose righteousness? Where do we find this righteousness? By the way, it's a good thing he didn't say, blessed are those who are righteous. <laughs> blessed are those who are sinless. And now you need to understand that that's what the people were waiting for. That's what they wanted to hear because that's what the Pharisees taught. Now, don't get me wrong, blessed are those who are righteous, but only those who are righteous in Christ Jesus. Amen? But he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Are you hungry and thirsty today for the Lord, for His Word, for His ways? Then you are a perfect candidate to be filled to the brim and overflowing by God Himself. We need to recognize our emptiness, right? First things for, first, I'm an empty cup. And the only one that can fill this up is the God who made it. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I'm going to give you a short lesson. I say short, but we'll see how short that really is. On what Bible scholars call positional righteousness, also known as imputed righteousness, and practical righteousness. Some of you have may, maybe have heard this for the very first time, but it's important to understand this. Now when the Lord says, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, He doesn't make a distinction necessarily regarding imputed righteousness and practical righteousness. And the reason why is because He wants us to be hungry and thirsty for all righteousness, both positional and practical. This is important to understand. 
And the reason why it's so important to understand is because there are many Christians who don't understand that you can be positionally righteous in Jesus Christ and yet not practically righteous and, and then feel a sense of emptiness. All right? So we're going to look at these two things. And not only are we called to hunger and thirst, but this word in the Greek literally means famished. To feel a sense of starving inside of you. You feel so empty like you haven't eaten for months, if that's even possible, physically speaking. And there's a sensation within your soul that says, I must have God or I will die. That is the kind of thirst and hunger he's talking about. He's not talking about skipping breakfast and then your stomach growling by noontime. He means skipping everything and being totally famished. No food, I need God. And if I don't take a bite or a drink, I will die. That is what he means by hunger and thirst for righteousness. By the way, an unbeliever, if you're one who is not born again here today, an unbeliever, he ought to yearn, thirst and hunger for positional righteousness. That is to be made right with God by Christ, by faith. The believer, on the other hand, they're already righteous positionally. God sees us and we are as right as Christ is Himself because he gave, he gave that righteousness to us. So we hunger for practical righteousness. Like, I want to live like God. That kind of righteousness. Right? I want to think like Him. I want to speak like Him. I want to act like Him. I want to love like Him. I want to hate sin like Him. I want to love righteousness like Him. I want to love truth. I want to proclaim it. Right? All that God loves, we grow in that practical righteousness and we begin to love. So number one, positional or imputed righteousness is Jesus' righteousness given to us by faith. It's Jesus' righteousness. Positional righteousness is Jesus' righteousness given to us. Notice, given, it's a gift. You can't buy it, you can't earn it. It's a gift. And it's by faith. What is the currency that we use? Faith. Put your righteousness away, put your good deeds and your good works away, put your money away. And just put out your hand like a poor man and say, put it in there, Lord. Save my soul. The moment we are born again, the moment the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives, our home becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. The moment that that happens, Jesus freely gives his righteousness to us from that point on. Which means from now on, now that we're born again, now that we're saved, now that we're righteous positionally by faith, God the Father sees us just as righteous as He sees His Son. That is incredible. And if Christians just understood that, the weight of that, the glory of that, the beauty of that, it is then that they can walk in the power of it. Because it's a reality. We are righteous. Just as Jesus is righteous. Positionally. We were made right by Jesus Christ as we put our trust in His rightness before His Father. In other words, Jesus gives us or credits us or deposits into our spiritually broke account His perfect obedience. You want to be made strong in your faith? If you're a believer today, remember this. Jesus lived and obeyed on your behalf. Perfectly. And He gave that obedience to you. Jesus overcame sin time and time again perfectly. And it's all yours. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. And it's all yours. He did all that for us and in our place, and He imputes all of His obedience to His saints. Positionally speaking, we are as righteous as Jesus Himself because, again, He is our righteousness. 
It's important to understand. Why am I saved today? Because Jesus made me right before God. There was nothing, absolutely nothing that I could do to make myself right before God. I understand that I was a peasant, spiritually speaking. And that's what made me hunger for His righteousness. If I desired at all that God would look upon me and smile, I knew that I would have to go to God through the Son. It says here, those who hunger for righteousness. In other words, this points to something that is outside of us, like a tasty sandwich on a table, right? It's outside of me. We don't possess righteousness of our own. That's what it means to be imputed. We got to get the sandwich and eat it. It's the same thing with the righteousness of God. We beg for it and we eat it by faith and it becomes ours and it becomes a part of who we are. Amen? Amen. Just like food. Just like food. The Pharisees, that is the religious leaders of Jesus' day, had established their own righteousness. The majority of this world has established their own righteousness. So when you think of religions, false religions like Catholicism or Mormonism or Buddhism or anything else ism, right? Any type of religious group, that's an establishment of their own self-righteousness. And the Pharisees were the kings of establishing their own righteousness. We find that in Romans chapter 10 and verse 3. And so then, all they had was self-righteousness. This means that they thought that they were righteous or good enough or acceptable to God without Jesus making them righteous. That is the problem of the world today. Why don't people want Jesus? Because they don't want His righteousness. They don't want His righteousness. They want to establish their own righteousness. Like, I want to get to God on my own. Have it your way. You're not getting there. But if you say, I can't get there on my own. Jesus says, come to me. I'll get you there. We're not good enough. And we're all going to stand before a judge that is holy, holy, holy. That alone, if you're not saved, should terrify you. Because what are you going to say? I didn't mean to do that. Not going to work. He's going to look for the imputed righteousness of his son. And he's going to look for the practical righteousness of his son. And if he doesn't find either, he will not allow you into his kingdom. Can I get an amen? Because again, only Jesus is truly perfect and truly righteous. He alone is the sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He alone. If there was another Lamb, then there would have been, there would have been two Lambs being uh, baptized by John. If there was another way, like Buddha, or Krishna, or Hare Krishna, or Muhammad, if there was another way, then they too would be the lambs of God who take away the sins of the world. If it was you, but we don't find that in Scripture. God the Father sent one man who is the God-man, and He alone can take away the sins of the world. He alone can bear the sins of the world because He is the sinless Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. There is no other person, there is no other way. The rest of us are unrighteous apart from Him. Our positional righteousness is no better than a filthy rag with the word righteous stitched on it. But it's just words and not reality. Isaiah 64, 6. Apart from Jesus, we're just a dirty rag. I mean, nobody would even use a dirty rag to clean a new car, would they? <laughs> no. It's worthless, useless. And so therefore we need the cleansing and the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yes. This is why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5.20, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds or passes or rises above the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
He was telling these people, you think that the Pharisees are the righteous ones, but they are devils in sheep's clothing. If your righteousness positionally and practically does not exceed the false righteousness, the self-righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, the Lord says you're not getting in. That alone ought to make us desperate. Makes me desperate. Oh, it humbles me and breaks me into a million pieces. I fall before the Lord and I recognize that apart from Him, all I am is a Pharisee. Amen? In other words, Jesus is saying, unless you possess my imputed righteousness and produce my practical righteousness, that is to live, to love, to think, to speak and obey like Christ, not perfectly, heaven's gates will be closed to us, just like it was closed to the Pharisees. And Paul understood this. Paul says, no good thing. Zero, zip, zilch, nada. Nothing, no good thing dwells in me that is in my flesh. Romans 7, 18. And the more you grow in Christ's likeness, the more that passage echoes in your heart. I am no good apart from Jesus. Where is His goodness? The entire world is made up of two religions. Don't forget this. They might tell you that there are thousands of religions, but don't forget this. There are only two. There is self-righteousness and the righteousness of Christ. That's it. That's it. Every single person, the sheep and the goats, will be divided by that one thing. Self-righteousness, eternal flames. Jesus' righteousness, eternal glory. That's it. You can call self-righteousness Buddhism. You can call it whatever you want. Mormonism. Jehovah's Witness, whatever you want to call it, or you want to make up a new religion yourself, that's fine. All of that will be under the category of self-righteousness. Everything else, the other side, is Jesus' righteousness. That's it, two religions. Self-righteousness, and what else? Christ-righteousness. There is no other church. There is no other I'm going to read a few verses that pertain to positional righteousness. Positional just means that I'm righteous positionally before God. Like right, right, right where I stand right now, because of what Jesus did, God the Father sees me as righteous as God the Son. Amazing. That is the gospel. That is the gospel message. Is there anything better than that? Is there a better news that you are seen by the eyes of God as He sees His own Son? Woo! That kind of stuff make you dance and sing and maybe break a leg, you know, trying it. No, seriously, that's where the joy comes from. It's recognizing who we are positionally in Christ the Lord because of what He did, not what we've done. Romans 4, 6, and 8 says this, But to him who does not work, but believes on him, that is Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Who? The one who doesn't work for his righteousness, but the one who believes on Jesus Christ for his positional righteousness. It says, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Amen. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That's positional righteousness. We can't work for it. We can only believe for it. 1 Corinthians 5.21 says, in other words, we can't work for our salvation. We do take part in our sanctification, which, which is something I'm going to point out next. But we cannot work. We take no part in our salvation. You add anything to the table and it's not good enough. A broken heart full of faith is all that God will accept. 1 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He made Him, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become, because we're not, we need to become. 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In who? In Jesus. By faith, Jesus took our sin on the cross and gave us his righteousness in return. This is the great glorious exchange. This is positional righteousness. By faith, he takes all your junk and he nails it to the cross. Then he gets all of his righteousness and puts it into your account. And no one is getting into heaven unless that happens. By faith. Amen? And Jeremiah 23, 6b says, The Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. The Lord alone our righteousness. Isaiah 45 and verse 24 says, In the Lord I have righteousness. He is my righteousness, in Him alone I have righteousness. Philippians 3, 9 says, And be found in Him, this is Paul speaking, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul understood that. You see, his whole life was about obeying the Ten Commandments and all the other laws in the Old Testament. And he took pride in it. No one's as righteous as me. That's the way he saw himself. But he says here, nope, not my own righteousness that's from the law. Not my own obedience apart from Jesus Christ. He says, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I hope you have a better handle on positional righteousness. This is one of the most important things you'll ever hear as a Christian. Apart from truly understanding this, you cannot enjoy a right, strong, rich relationship with God until you get this deeply rooted in your heart. By faith, I am as righteous as Jesus himself. Which means that he cannot throw me into hell. In doing so, it would be like God the Father casting his own son in hell, which will never happen. But those who don't have positional righteousness, they will taste the flames forever. Because they're paying for their own sins there. Instead of the cross, which is free, which is awesome. Number two, practical righteousness. Practical righteousness is us living like and being like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why Art was singing, rain down Lord, rain down Lord, let your spirit pour. We, we need Him. Practical righteousness is living like Jesus through the power of Jesus. Here are a few passages that pertain to practical righteousness. I'm just going to read them to you so that way you don't get lost. Matthew 7, 21 and 23, it says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, listen, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's practical righteousness. He who does what the Bible says to do. Not perfectly. Oh, but we grow in that obedience, don't we? Many will say to me in that day, notice he says many, there's going to be a lot of people on the day of judgment who are going to say this, Lord, Lord. When you hear them say Lord, Lord twice, that refers to them being emphatic and sure about him being Lord, L-O-R-D, Yahweh the Son, the judge of the universe. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In other words, we preached about you. We did outreach in the front on 6th Ave. We, we, we wrote about you. We sang about you. Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then he says this, and then I would declare to them, I never knew you. There was never positional righteousness. I never knew you. 
You tried to skip positional righteousness right into practical righteousness and you became a devil. That's what he's talking about. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. They skipped the righteousness of God and they tried to live the practical righteousness of God without the power of God. Those are the most miserable Christians in the earth. The most miserable. He says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Notice it's not practical righteousness, but practical lawlessness. In other words, here we find many religious people who are hungry for ministry positions. Authority over devils, miracle signs and wonders, but they were not hungry for God and His will and to obey Him. Which is righteousness, or should I say practical righteousness, in a nutshell. They hungered for dead religion, not rich relationship. That's, that's the difference. Self-righteousness, dead religion. Even in the name of Jesus. You can be a Mormon. You can be a Protestant. You can be a professing Christian. But without positional righteousness, you are in the category of self-righteousness. Without practical righteousness... We find that possibly there was never positional righteousness to begin with. Does that make sense? And so Jesus is telling this group, look, there's a whole bunch of you right now. You take pride in coming to church. You take pride in opening your Bible and giving your money. You take pride of being involved in all the little church functions and gatherings. You take pride in all of that. But you don't take pride in obeying my word. You don't humble yourself enough to know what I want and to do it with all of your heart with a big fat smile on your face. That's the difference. Dead religion, rich relationship. Two religions. That's another way to look at it. Oh, but the Lord wants us to enjoy Him, church. The Lord wants us to enjoy Him. 2 Timothy 2.19b says... Let everyone who names the name of Christ, that is, they call themselves Christian, depart from iniquity. That is ongoing sin, doing things that God hates and that grieves and quenches the person of the Holy Spirit. That is practical righteousness. You can have, you can have positional righteousness and very little practical righteousness, but you'll be a very unhappy, not so strong and confident Christian. But you can't have positional righteousness and no practical righteousness. That's a false convert. Make sense? It has to be practical righteousness, and it can be imperfect, but it must be growing and increasing as your knowledge of God increases. Can I get an amen? In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, it says... He who says he abides in Jesus ought himself also to walk just as he walked. That is practical righteousness. If we say that we are disciples of Jesus Christ and yet our footsteps are going that way and not behind him, there could be a real problem there. Practical righteousness, departing from evil, living like Jesus growing in the character and the likeness of Christ day by day. Listen to me, if you're going to covet anything in this world, don't let it be cars. Don't let it be a high position in some business. Don't even let it be a big church or a small church or a name in some ministry. Forget all of that. You want to covet something? Covet the character of Jesus Christ and don't be satisfied until you get it. Amen? It's the only thing that's getting in. Psalm 106.3 says, Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness. Sometimes. Oh no, it says, at all times. Sorry. This is, my glasses didn't work for a moment there. That is what it means to have and desire positional righteousness. It doesn't mean that you're going to be righteous at, practically at all times, but it does mean that you hunger and thirst for it at all times. And you don't feel a satisfaction within your soul until you get it. And when you get it, you want more. Like I can see Jesus in me right now. I want more. That is the, the feeling someone has within them. Oh, power. Having power over this tongue sure does feel good. Having power over my 
My mind and my thoughts feels great. I want more. Being able to shine bright feels good. I want more and more and more and more. That's the attitude of the believer. That is the attitude that God desires for us to have. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for his imputed and practical righteousness. Those who desperately desire to be saved and sanctified. There are far too many people who want salvation, but they don't want sanctification. Which means that they don't want to go to hell, but yet they don't want to be like Christ. No, 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 no. We desire to be saved and we desire to be sanctified. And not only do we desire it, we desire it to the point of give it to me or I die. That's the reason why I always say that you cannot get into the kingdom of heaven unless you're desperate. Broken, desperate, poor, hungry, thirsty. Not a, not a drop of water, not a morsel of bread in your pocket. Nothing. And it is then that you can be saved. And it is then that you can be made righteous practically. Amen? You add anything to it, to the equation, you're messing things up. You're messing things up. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that this ongoing hunger is a sure sign of true conversion. This ongoing hunger is a true sign, a sure sign of true conversion. And so then the question has to be, are you hungry? I'm not talking about a Big Mac down the street or a, a Whopper. I'm talking about God and His likeness. Are you hungry? Hungry. If you are, you're a child of God. If you're not, we'll look at some reasons why you're not in a moment if you are a child of God. We must hunger for His Word if we will get His ways. It goes hand in hand. If you say here today, I hunger for the character of God, but yet you don't hunger for the Word of God, for the preaching of the Word, for the study of the Word, I doubt that you want His ways, and I'll tell you why. Because it's only in His Word and through the preached Word that we can find the ways of God to the point of desiring it. Make sense? You can't say, I desire righteousness and not desire His Word. That's, that's a contradiction. It's a contradiction. And we'll look at it right here in 2 Peter 1, 3-4. Let us go to 2 Peter 1, 3-4. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Let us read verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Notice that word knowledge. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that is practical righteousness, through the knowledge of Him, who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, practical righteousness, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we find here that it is through knowledge that we grow in the divine nature of God. Why don't many Christians grow like tall, beautiful pine trees? Not enough knowledge. That's why. You can be a Christian and be a stump. And that's because you don't know God. Or you can be a tall pine tree like the ones we see on Mount Lemmon. Because you're growing in the knowledge of God. If you skip the knowledge of God, you skip the nature and character and growth and practical righteousness of God. That's the way it works. That's the reason why church is absolutely essential. Amen? We grow in the knowledge of God. The most essential physical needs for humanity is food and water. Nobody would debate that. Man cannot live without food and water. 
for too long. The most essential spiritual need is God Himself. A man like Esau, starving for food, says, Give me food or I die. He traded his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. I love lentils, but not that much. I really love lentils. Um, <laughs> all this hungry stuff is making me hungry. All this hungry talk. A man who starts for righteousness, that is God's character, says, Give me God's righteousness or I die. Your body says, Give me food and drink or I die. Your soul says, Give me God's righteousness, the bread of life, the word of God, the spirit of God, the ways of God, or I die. Jesus wants us to want Him. If you remember anything today, remember that. Jesus wants us to want Him. He wants us to have an all-consuming passion. A desperate desire, a holy ambition for Him. That is a rich relationship with Him. And His awesome ways. That is His character. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Come, no more hunger. Believe, quench your thirst. Better than a 44-ounce thirst buster, guaranteed. Thirst quenched in Christ. Why do you think that Jesus Christ wasn't building earthly kingdoms on earth? Why do you think he wasn't collecting sandals? Why do you think he wasn't trying to make a name for himself? Why? Because he was filled by God the Father's relationship with him. If you're materialistic today, it's because you're not filled. If you're grasping and fighting and wanting and craving and dreaming for the stuff this world has to offer, you're not filled with God. You need to get filled by him. The more satisfied you are, with the little you have because you have God, you are growing in His righteousness. It's not to say we can't like nice things, but it's to say that nothing compares to Christ. And I will put all these things aside to get Him first. Amen? Jesus is the only soul satisfier that there is. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus tells her something Super amazing. It was revolutionary, really. He tells her, if you drink of this water, you're going to get thirsty again. But if you drink from the water I have to offer, you'll never thirst again. He said, Lord, give me this water. Where does it come from? The Lord showed her that He's it. He's the fountain of life. View Jesus as a fountain that flows from heaven right into your heart. That's Christ, and He fills you up. Amen? There was a man today as I was pumping gas. He was selling some leftover beer. And to be quite honest with you, I just wanted to hurry up and get here until the Spirit of God starts convicting you. You all know how that feels. And so I called him over again, and I said, Sir, just give me a moment of your time. Let me tell you the reason why I don't want to buy your beer. And it's not because I don't like Budweiser. Um, and so I told him, I said, look, sir, before, before Jesus Christ came into my life, I desired this stuff you're selling, just to drink it up, do drugs, do other things to fill the hole in my soul, I told him. But I was always coming up empty, sir, always, and so will you. And I said, but when Jesus Christ filled my soul and keeps filling my soul, I said, this stuff, sir, does nothing for me and nothing to me. I am satisfied in Christ. And I say, can I pray for you? He's like, it's just tripping out, you know, like, yeah. You know? So I did. And I pray that God does something in his heart. And he fills his heart with himself. I was praying that he would throw that beer away and say, Jesus, I need a drink from you. If it's true what this man says, I want you. That's it, church. Jesus also warns in John 6, 25, Woe that is cursed to you who are full. For you shall hunger. People who are full of themselves, people who are full of things, of stuff, of the sins of this fallen world, 
instead of Jesus Christ, they will end up hungry now and later. The perfect example of that has to be the rich man and Lazarus. When the rich man died, he went to hell. Jesus tells the story, a certain man, which means this is a real story in my opinion. And he's in hell and he's begging for one drop of water. One drop! Jesus says here, Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. In this man's case, thirst. And the Lord says, while you were on earth, you had everything you wanted. The point was, you put me last. You rejected me, the true living waters. And you had a fill of your fanciful things and didn't love the poor in the process. And he says that this man is begging for one drop of water right now. Back then, 2,000 years ago, that rich man is still there right now, crying out for one drop of water. Do people who are full, apart from Christ, become empty and hungry forever? You better believe it. You better believe it. And if you're one today who has not put your trust in Jesus Christ, I can guarantee you, you're going to have a place right next to that rich man. And you're going to be begging for the same drop of water, and it will never come. But if today, today you give your life to Jesus... You will drink from the fountains of the living waters of God and you will never thirst again. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I'm almost closing here. Let us read Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21. It's a parable of another rich man. Luke 12. 16 to 21. We're talking about being full of ourselves, full of the stuff of this world, and being emptied of God. Luke 12, 16 to 21. By the way, there are these two relatives that are fighting for possessions, and they come up to Jesus and says, Hey, can you fix our problem? And Jesus tries to fix the real problem, and he teaches the man, It's not that you don't have possessions. It's that you love them more than God. That's your problem. That's what he told them. Covetousness is your problem. So let us read here. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself saying, What shall I do? Well, I mean, somebody that has the merciful heart of God would get that food and start giving it to those who are needy, right? Not this man. Since I have no room to store up my crops, in other words, he is filled to the brim. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. In other words, I am so full, I want to be more full, so I'm going to take down these barns and make bigger barns and fill those with all my stuff too. And then he goes on to say, 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, Remember I told you that we're all created with a soul hole or a, a hole in our soul? He's talking to that hole right now. He says, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. There it is. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those will... Then those then whose will those things be which you have provided? Listen, this is, the, this is the point, 21. So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Materialism will be the reason why many will not hunger for God in and out of the church, guaranteed. Guaranteed. Stuff shines too much, looks too good. And then God gets the back seat. Let us be careful. Amen. Let us put God first. So basically, he's telling this man, look, you, you were rich. You were rich in your own eyes, but you weren't rich in the eyes of God. In fact, Luke 1, 53 says, God has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. In other words, those who are poor in spirit, those who are truly hungry spiritually, those who are humble, get filled. And those who are prideful. Those who are rich apart from God, they leave empty-handed. This will be my last point. 
and it's a meaty one. <laughs> so get your forks and your knives, and let's dig into this last piece of meat. And the Lord strongly, again, the Lord strongly desires that we strongly desire Him. Again, He's the ultimate source of soul satisfaction and true, real, lasting, genuine happiness. But there is a paradox here. Because as we pursue the Lord and His ways, we are totally satisfied in Him. At the same time, because of His goodness, we end up wanting more. We're satisfied, dissatisfied. That's what it means to keep hungering and keep thirsting. You taste them, you love it, you want more. When I eat one bowl of Marla's caldo de queso, <laughs> and some of you who have tasted would say amen, I am satisfied. At the same time, that satisfaction and that fulfillment, right, those taste buds dancing in my mouth, want another bowl. It's the same thing with God. You taste a little bit of Him and you ask for seconds and thirds and fourths. And I'm asking you right now, are you asking for more? Are you thirsting and craving for more? That's the reason why we keep coming. Because we keep eating and we keep drinking until we're made perfectly satisfied in glory. Amen? Some of you are probably thinking you need to invite us over. We will, just let us know you want to come. <laughs> so we want more of God, we want more of His love, we want more of His character, we want more of His wisdom, more of His good pleasure, more of His nearness, more of His grace, more of His mercy, more of His light, more of His revelation, more, more, more. And listen to me, that is the happy life. The happy life is the life that sits at the table of God and says, fill me up every day. That's the happy life. That is the happy life. When your soul has tasted of God, you're drawn to Him in the same way that your taste buds are drawn to your favorite restaurants. Why do you go to your favorite restaurants? Because there's a growl in your belly and you need to get there. It's the same thing with God. When you have an inner growl in your belly, in your stomach, in your soul, you can't help but go to God and feed from this good and loving shepherd of ours. The way food tugs on the belly, Jesus tugs on the soul. I call it soul hunger, soul thirst. Do you have it? Do you have it? I believe that there are many Christians who are unhappy, discontented, unfulfilled, simply because they have spoiled their appetite. Some of us aren't being filled because we're, we're spoiling our appetite. We're like the little kid who's drinking and eating all kinds of junk food, the junk food of the world. What are you consuming? I'll tell you, I'll te you tell me what you're consuming and I'll tell you why you're unhappy. It's that easy. Simple. You tell me what you're eating, I'll tell you why you're dissatisfied. They are like the little kids who eat Oreos and gummy worms and marshmallows before dinner. There are many Christians like this. Immature children don't have an appetite for healthy foods like immature Christians don't have an appetite for God. Why? Because they're already eating the junk of this world. The Lord says, let that go, come get me. I'll show you what true happiness is. Yes. And I'm telling you something, it is true happiness. Like you're literally sitting there completely <sighs> contented to the bone. Done. And that is something that you have to keep up. How so? Keep coming to the table. Keep coming to the table. You stay alive, don't you? Wake up in the morning, eat breakfast. I'm not a big breakfast guy, uh, but uh, I know some of you are. Lunch, dinner, how do you stay alive? How do you grow physically? You keep going to the table. Spiritually speaking, you keep coming to His table. Keep coming to His table. There's room for you. There's room for all of you. There's room for all seven plus billion people on earth at the Lord's table. The question is, are they hungry enough? Are they thirsty enough? In order to really enjoy communion with God, listen to me. In order to enjoy 
communion with God, we must grow in the nature of God. That's the way it works. You want to enjoy God? You need to grow in God likeness. And what is God likeness? The fruit of the Spirit. You bear more of the fruit of the Spirit and you enjoy a richer, more tangible, undeniable relationship with your God. It is when we're more like Him that we can enjoy Him. It is when we're not like Him and we don't want to go to the table. We want to go sneak in and get some red vines instead of the, the meat that God provides. Oh, I'm telling you, church, there are far too many Christians who are unhappy simply because they're unholy. That's it. That's it. I know it's very simple to understand, but it's not always simple to apply. And that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Moses wanted more of God. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses' request of God, please show me your glory. Listen to me. Moses has seen some tremendous things. You know the story. We're going to go into Exodus here soon on Wednesday. and You'll be reminded of the story. Moses saw God humble Pharaoh. Seven plagues, uh, ten plagues. Humbling Pharaoh, humbling Egypt. And he saw God part the Red Sea and take out the Israelites from there and into the promised land eventually. And he saw God close the waters and drown all their enemies. You will not see the, the, the Egyptians anymore, he says. And Moses saw all of this. He saw all of it and he was seeing more and more as God was revealing to him who he was. And he says, oh Lord, show me your glory. What he's saying is, is to show me all of you. And God says, you can't see all of me, buddy, or you'll die. Hide in this little crevice. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. The cleft in his side. And he says, I'll walk by and you can see my backside. But you can't see my face, Moses, or you'll die. Do you understand that Moses was asking God for what we all should be asking God? To see His glory. And we see His glory in the face of His Son, Jesus Christ, don't we? And so we ought to desire more measures of God in our lives. I pray that we would all be like Moses in this, at this point. We are those who say, God's more than enough, but I can't get enough of God. God is more than enough, but I can't get enough of God. I can't seem to get enough of God. That's what Moses was saying. You are awesome. You are incredible. You are breathtaking. But can I see some more, please? Can I get some more of you, Lord? That's the secret to growing in Christ. That's the secret of living a holy, satisfied life. Staring at Christ. Staring at God. In Psalm 17, King David says that there are many men who are satisfied with the temporal blessings of this passing world. In verse 15, he says, As for me, in other words, he says, these guys over here, they're satisfied with just having babies and collecting cars and houses. They're cool with that. He says, but as for me, now I'm paraphrasing, but you can read the chapter and that's the point. He says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. These people live and die for this passing world. He says, me, I'm going to see you in your righteousness and I'm going to be righteous as I look into your righteous face. And then he says, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. In other words, I will be fully satisfied when I'm glorified and I'm exactly like God in regards to his holy and perfect and good and righteous nature. David was looking forward to the culmination of Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is it. This is just walking in this life, honoring God, doing everything that you're supposed to do by His power and His grace. And, and then you can't wait 
to rise again and be made perfectly righteous, not a speck of sin, not a perverted thought, not a lustful desire, no other crave but that which is pure and good and holy in the sight of God. That's what David is saying. He says full satisfaction is coming, but I can't find it fully here, but it's coming. It's coming. If I can have Art come and prepare, I want to read these last two thoughts. The true child of God not only strongly desires to be saved by Christ, listen to me, but even more, they desperately desire to be made like Christ. Not just saved by Christ, but made like Christ. And that is my overarching responsibility to you, that you would grow in Christ likeness. And I do that through ongoing study, ongoing praying, doing my best to be an example to you. At the same time, you're doing your study, you're doing your praying, you're connecting to God, and you are being made more like Jesus Christ. A year from now, I desire that all of us would be a little more like Jesus. A year seems kind of long, I say, in the next hour, next minute, next second, right? <laughs> because it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. First it's a heart issue and then it becomes something that we do practically with our hands, our eyes, our feet, our mouths, and, and so on. But more like Christ. More like Christ. So my question before I close is, again, are you hungry? Are you thirsty for God? Are you thirsty for His righteousness? There are far too many people thirsty for the world and the things of the world and the people of the world and the stuff of this world. But are you hungry for Him? Are you thirsty for God? And you might be honest here today and say, no, I'm that bratty little kid who's just looking for the red vines right now. I stay away from the meat. I stay away from His table. I ruin my appetite. I'm spoiled. To you, I say, ask God to give you an appetite for Him, a fresh, new appetite. Appetite for him. Appetite just means a desire. How are you going to get it? You going to buy it? You going to work for it? That will do the opposite to you. You ask for it. You humbly come before the Lord like an empty bucket and say, Pour yourself into me, Lord. And you mean it. And you mean it. 